places and all of a sudden they're just staying in their home. They're, they're not talking to anyone anymore. There could be many reasons for that, but one of them could be because they're being abused. Uh, that, that kind of withdrawal is, is a real sign of elder abuse. So neighbors are going to see that. If, if they start losing weight, is it because they don't have the money to buy food or is it that someone is withholding the food or they're, mm -hmm. or they're self neglect and, mm -hmm. and not eating. So I think we all have to think of ourselves as neighbors of someone that may be being uh, abused mm -hmm. and, and, and mm -hmm. that's important. And, and Ms. Fer uh, uh, Ms. Grumman, I think you've got some information dealing with uh, methods whereby people might be able to report. Uh, instances of uh, elder abuse and et cetera. Let's, let's talk about it from that perspective right. and how they might be able to help you and Ms. Farringer do what you have to do. Uh, this is the number for Adult Protective Services. This is a statewide toll-free number that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, after hours, I do believe it goes to voicemail, but someone will uh, handle the phone call um, the next day. And the 1-800 number is 888-277-8366. Um, 888-277-8366. And that's in order to make a report to Adult Protective Services. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to mention to be vigilant um, within your uh, church community, mm -hmm. within your um, religious uh, faith-based mm -hmm. community. Um, if you uh, aren't seeing your older congregates uh, there anymore on Sundays, if they sort of disappear after a few weeks, uh, try to find out what's happening, uh, what's happening to those folks. Um, there's a reason why they're not coming anymore. Um, and, and so it might be a good idea to do a little, mm -hmm. do a little investigation your, yourself um, mm -hmm. to see. Uh, now, now your organization is a local supported organization by the metropolitan government. Is that right? It is not. It is not. We are a uh, private nonprofit. Um, Mental Health America. Mm -hmm. We're an affiliate of a larger national Mental Health America, mm -hmm. um, and we are an affiliate for Middle Tennessee. Mm -hmm. We have an aging and Alzheimer's program, mm -hmm. so we can provide caregiver support groups. Mm -hmm. uh, we can provide free in-home caregiver education mm -hmm. and training. Uh, we do educational presentations to both family members as well as healthcare professionals mm -hmm. and senior service providers throughout the 13 Middle Tennessee counties, and all of our services are free of charge. Mm -hmm. So um, Mental Health America's number is 615-269-5355. Now, is there a local component of uh, elder abuse? I mean, is there something that the, the metropolitan government is doing? Uh, is your organization the only organization within the government that, that deals with, elder, with the elder population? No, there's, there's adult protective services locally here, mm -hmm. and, um, and then the Tennessee uh, Vulnerable Adult Coalition, which is a statewide coalition, mm -hmm. has regional coalitions mm -hmm. and the Elder Abuse Initiative group that meets locally uh, may turn into one of those local um, uh, groups here in Nashville. And so this, uh, uh, Ms. Farragher? Yeah, um, I was going to add that uh, there also, we haven't mentioned the ombudsman, and mm -hmm. that's not a word we yeah. use all the time, mm -hmm. um, but the ombudsman is funded by the Area Agency on Aging, which is a uh, government agency, uh, but they particularly are on the lookout for abuse in facilities, assisted living, homes for the aged, nursing homes, and so mm -hmm. if your loved one or a friend is in in one of those facilities and you suspect there being some abuse, you can call that ombudsman uh, and they can kind of pave the way for uh, an investigation to happen. So that's uh, also um, Metro government um, has just um, recommended the establishment of an Office of Public Guardian, um, which I think will assist this effort. Um, and also they're making some headway um, on of a kind of addressing 
domestic violence and elder abuse will come under that umbrella too. So we're, we're hopeful that the, the word is gonna get out more. Um, another point that I would make, um, I, I can picture uh, some overworked, tired caregivers at home that are caring for an elderly person and sometimes feeling, just getting so frustrated they feel, I could hit her. <laughs> uh, and we don't want them to despair. Caregiving is a very, very difficult job, but there are things that can help that caregiver. There are support groups, there are different services. Um, the Council on Aging publishes a directory of services for seniors that's free, they can pick a copy up at branches of the public library. So let them get that book that describes some services that might be able to help them and not feel so overwhelmed. And so we think that over the last three minutes we have, uh, <clears throat> let's make an assessment. We can say that elder abuse is a real problem uh, from a local point of view or from a governmental point of view. And that Absolutely. You all ought to be more aware of what is going on around uh, us. And is that what we're saying? We, we should. And part of what our committee is, is kind of coming to the conclusion of is there's a need for some materials for the general public, and the YWCA has an excellent brochure for the general public, but we think law enforcement needs to know a little bit more on what are the signs of elder abuse, what do I do if I suspect elder abuse, how do I you know, handle it through the law enforcement system. Medical professionals need this. Everything from therapists to people in emergency rooms, they need to know what are the signs and what do I do if I suspect it. Uh, we had a discussion today that bank personnel certainly can suspect financial abuse, but they need to know what do I do if I suspect it. So it we. Would, uh, it would appear to me over the last minute and a half that we have here that these organizations and these services ought to already have that kind of information and be working with them. And I think they do have some, but maybe not so much tailored just to their uh, particular profession, and maybe it's not what they need. So we're trying to ask. Mm -hmm. We're asking banks and law enforcement mm -hmm. and uh, medical professionals, what, what do you need? Do you need training? Do you need speakers? Do you need a list of the signs of elder abuse? Or is it that you need to know what to do if I suspect elder abuse? Very good. And of course, the last statement, uh, Ms. Grumman, in reference to this, we've got about a minute and, and a half in reference to that. Just recently, the Tennessee State Legislature did pass uh, some legislation um, forming an elder abuse task force with a number of members that will be making a report to the Tennessee State Legislature in January of 2015. So it's obviously on their radar screen and I think hopefully we'll see more and more uh, services uh, in the future. And so many things, good things are happening in terms of dealing with uh, the elder population uh, in the state of Tennessee and uh, your organization and the other state organizations simply represent part of what is going on but uh, the two of you look toward uh, the organization having a greater reach within some of the areas, the mm -hmm. law enforcement and et cetera, right. and that uh, they are not currently actively involved in. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, and, and they want to be. Mm -hmm. They want to, but they're busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and they need to have the correct information. Very good. Let me thank the two of you for coming by and giving us that excellent information. And let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good morning.
Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is debt relief and reparations for the African American community and historical black colleges. And we have with us to talk about debt relief and uh, relief and reparations for African American communities and historical black colleges, Mr. Kenneth Kane. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Kane is the president of an organization that has considerably has dealt with Tennessee State University and other institutions dealing with debt relief. And with Mr. Kane is Ms. Jamila Terrell. Ms. Terrell is also a student, a graduate student at Tennessee State University and has a lot of information in reference to the African American community and historical black colleges. And let me, uh, Mr. Uh, Kane and Ms. Terrell, Welcome both of you to the show this morning. Thank you, Thank sir. You. And tell you how delighted we are to have the two of you with us, primarily because the uh, topic this morning is a very, very important topic. Sure. And so what we'll do, Mr. Kane, is to have you as well as uh, Mr. Rail to give us some information about your background, your education, and some of the things that were important in terms of leading you to uh, this particular place as well as this particular topic this morning. You can give us some information in reference to that, and of course, Ms. Uh, Terrell will uh, give us some information about her background, education, and some of the experiences that has uh, been important in terms of bringing her to us this morning. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have an opportunity during the second segment to get into the nuts and bolts of mm -hmm. debt relief and reparations for African-American institutions. Let's start off with you, Mr. Kane, then followed by you, Mr. Terrell. First, I want to thank you for having us on your show. I'm from Alabama, uh, a little small town called Fayette, Alabama. Uh, I'm a military veteran, served, uh, I served seven years in the Army, and I'm also a graduate of Tennessee State University. So I moved here in 1996, um, and I finished uh, TSU in uh, 1996, and I'm a speech language pathologist by always had are forced you know I'm a deacon in my church so for me to just try my religion and so uh, you know the whole debt uh, piece is really a of very good and Mr. Rail what about you and your background well, I am originally from the south side of Chicago. I graduated from Whitney Young, which is also the alma mater of our first lady. So I'm very proud of that. Very um, I came to Tennessee State in 1994, and I originally came to be a physical therapy major because I wanted to help people that I was sure about. Um, and then I learned about uh, Africana studies. So I took a class and I was hooked. And I ended up majoring in Africana Studies, so I earned a bachelor's in Africana Studies. I also did some postgraduate work at the um, University of Mary Knoll, um, St. Mary's University in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I did a postgraduate program there, um, thanks to Dr. Hardy. He was one of my mentors at TSU, and Dr. El Hadid and yourself. And so from there, um, I studied in Nairobi in 98 for three, sum three months during that summer, and during that time period, the uh, embassies were bombed. Um, it was quite an experience. And then I came back and finished um, my undergraduate degree. And then I started a family. Um, and so I'm also a wife and mother of five kids. And then I recently earned my MBA in global management from the University of Phoenix. And currently I am the community school coordinator at Wright Middle School for Metro. And I also am a certified bra fitter at Nordstrom. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, and, and of course, uh, Mr. Kane, let, why don't you give us over the last minute, and I think that we have many, mm -hmm. 10, 15 seconds, mm -hmm. uh, why don't you give us an overview of some of the things that you'd like for us to uh, talk about this morning? We we're going to talk, just take about a minute to do Okay, that. well, we have to talk about the economic uh, deprivations that our community faces all across the country, um, the enormous joblessness, the underemployment. Uh, you know, people can't get jobs. Um, people have felonies. So we have so many barriers to being able to take care of our families. We have to try to address this because I think economics is at the bottom of most of our issues, whether it's in health care, education, and so on and so forth. So we must begin to deal with our economic condition in America. 
Very good. And I think, Mr. Kane, you've been with us on another occasion dealing yeah. with uh, yeah. how to uh, create a situation yeah. so that Africans can, African Americans can become more uh, involved sure. with this whole process. Sure. And, and this is just another continuation in a real sense of some of the things that you talked about uh, doing the first time. And so what we'll do is to take our first commercial break, Mr. Okay. Kane, and then Ms. Uh, Terrell will get back uh, doing the second segment. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to uh, Mr. Kenneth, Ture uh, Mr. Kenneth uh, Kane and uh, Mr. Mila Terrell, uh, both people uh, who are interested in uh, debt relief for historical black colleges and African American communities. And of course, Mr. Kane, let's pick up where we left off okay. uh, during that first segment and give you an opportunity to say something about historical black colleges and some of the uh, financial situations that many of these institutions find themselves in. Mm -hmm. And of course, Ms. Uh, Terrell will give us some information in reference to uh, the African American communities. Mm -hmm. And we'll try to tie all of that together sure. during the uh, third segment and come up with some kind of uh, what we might propose as a solution to what we're talking about here. Let's start off uh, from that perspective. Uh, okay, well, first I want to begin with talking about a group, an organization that has been formed in Nashville. It's called the Save TSU Community Coalition. I'm not the president, by the way. Um, I'm just one of the members. Uh, there, it's composed of faculty and students as well as folks in the community. So what's happening with our historical black colleges all across the country is that um, our programs are being copied and duplicated uh, by white institutions. And so that's happening at Tennessee State as well. And so the group formed to try to combat this thing. Um, so that's the first point. Then the second point is that in, in 2010, uh, the state of Tennessee came out with a new law called the Complete College Act. And that act, um, basically, it takes away the the, the ability of a university to offer courses that can be remedial. If, you know, for kids coming out of high school may need some um, extra help in areas like English or math. Well, um, that ability was taken away from the state universities and given to the local uh, um, community colleges. And so that has contributed to a great um, brain drain from Tennessee State. So we're trying to deal with this. And so we're, we're organizing ourselves, recognizing that our institutions are long, they have a long history, of producing um, you know, great leaders, and professionals like yourself and others. So we want to continue this uh, avenue and stream for our young folks coming along. You know? And so the whole debt relief part comes in because our colleges are challenged, you know, uh, because students bring money to the universities, right? 
So if you have a drain of students coming to the school, well then there's gonna be a drain in the money. And so as a result, all across the country, these things are happening with our black colleges. And so this is part of our efforts to try and try to deal with these things in our time. So what you're saying now is that instead of students uh, going directly to, uh, as freshmen into mm -hmm. uh, historical black, well, an institution of higher education, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. students who find themselves uh, challenged as the overwhelming majority of students who a large number of students mm -hmm. who, who generally, like myself, yeah, my, and like myself. many of us yeah, right, who, right. who first started out mm -hmm. in, uh, at uh, many of these institutions of higher education, mm -hmm. find ourselves challenged now in, instead of now enrolling in a traditional four-year institution like Tennessee State University, mm -hmm. those students who might have wanted to go to Tennessee State University can no longer go to a four-year institution, but now will have to go to a junior institution exactly. or a community college mm -hmm. in preparation to go to what? The uh, uh, Tennessee State University or some of the other institutions within the uh, system. Is that, what, is that the uh, gist, of, gist of what, we, what, what, what is going on here? Yes, and also I wanted to add that in the state of Maryland, uh, an historic uh, lawsuit occurred among the four black colleges in the state of Maryland because uh, Maryland did the same thing. Um, a lot of their uh, white institutions were draining and copying their programs, their academic programs. And so a lawsuit emerged and those four black colleges won. Uh, it was Morgan State, uh, Bowie State, um, and there are two others, but they won their case. And so now there are several colleges, black colleges around the country trying to get involved in that lawsuit because the lawsuit, um, the ruling said that the state of Maryland must return those copied programs back to these universities. And so Tennessee State is um, potentially going to participate in that, in, in that lawsuit. So we're, we're pushing for that to happen as well. And, and before we get into the communities, Ms. Uh, Terrell, uh, let's, let's look, a, look again at this idea of uh, copying programs. Exactly what do you mean when you say that institutions are copying programs from the uh, historical black institutions of higher education so that they might use these same programs. Mm -hmm. Well, Ronda, how, how do you define copying programs uh, when you say that? Well, for instance, uh, TSU has an engineering program and it's, and it's been highly successful. Well, there have been other schools in the city who have tried, not the, well, not the city, but the surrounding counties, who have uh, duplicated their programs. And so now kids have more options when you look at that. And so the net result is that our student population declines in that area, you know, along with the monies that go along with that and the prestige. Um, and so that's what we mean by copying. Now, Dr. Uh, Ray Richardson, you may, I'm sure you know him. He's an expert on this subject. Perhaps you should, you know, you could have him on, on one of your shows one day to talk about this, mm -hmm. this whole process that's happening with our schools. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, yeah. now, 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 Mr. Terrell, uh, let's look at uh, so some of the impact over the next couple of minutes, and then we'll start with you on the, this last uh, segment. Let's look at some of the impact that uh, debt uh, relief and, and reparations is having on the African-American community from your perspective and from your worldwide view in terms of having gone to Africa from, and et cetera, and et cetera, all from that perspective. I would say one of the things that ways that it impacts us is the programs that are offered in our communities are often cut. And those programs directly impact the family. Um, a lot of times programs that are put into place help mothers and they help children. And when you start cutting programs that provide resources and education and opportunities and experiences for children, then you create a situation where children are not allowed to have exposure or you know, certain experiences that are only given to children who come from privileged backgrounds. Um, and a lot of times, especially in today's economy, we just can't afford it. You know, um, like I said, I'm a wife and I have five kids and my husband is an educator and educators don't make a lot of money. And so I have dreams and desires for my children to have specific types of experiences and sometimes in order to fund them, it becomes kind of impossible and then you have to find yourself working more than one job and then if you're working more than one job, you're leaving your child unattended or you're unavailable to transport them to the activities that you are trying to be able to afford for them. And that becomes a problem. Now, now I, I, we're getting uh, ready for the uh, third, uh, uh, the uh, 
third segment here, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Rail. But when we come back, we want to pick up with that because I think that one of the questions that we have to deal with during this uh, third segment is that uh, we're talking about the allocation of resources. That's essentially what you're talking about. The you, you just look, you're not getting enough money uh, mm -hmm. from the uh, government or from local situations, and except. And, and so we, that's what we want to do. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Mr. Kenneth Kane and uh, Mr. Amelia uh, Terrell about uh, the debt relief and reparations for historical black colleges as well as African American communities. And Mr. Terrell, I think we left off, when we left off, we promised that we'd come back during this final segment to give you an opportunity to talk about some of the deprivations mm -hmm. in terms of financial resources and resources that ought to be coming to the uh, African community and et cetera. And so let's do it from that perspective and from, from your point of view. Well, I thought I did what I was supposed to do to become a part of the middle class. Mm -hmm. And although I may kind of feel like that's where I'm at, mm, I don't always feel that way. And so I find it, you know, difficult because at times, you know, when you try to apply for programs, you may make a little too much money to qualify to get the resources or you don't make just enough to be able to afford it on your own. And so that becomes a problem. Um, and a lot of our children are out there on the streets because they don't have any, you know, any activities. You know, one of the things that I think about when it comes to my childhood and when you talk to elders who talk to you about raising your children, you know, they talk about keeping them busy. I was too busy to do anything. I had swim practice, dance practice, church and Sunday school, choir rehearsal, youth group. There was no time for play unless my parents said it was okay. And then it was guided and it was structured. Um, and so today, you know, I'm working two jobs. My husband is working a job and then finding ways to be in the community. And you're a middle class person, that's what, uh huh. You know, we're homeowners. We have pretty good kids, you know. So I consider ourselves to be a part of that, that class that we thought we were supposed to be in. And, and it's difficult. Um, because there are programs that I want my kids in and I can't afford it and it makes me sad You know and then I think about the fact that I have this knowledge and I'm supposed to be a part of this class that can afford it And then I think about the people who have no knowledge and don't have access to these programs and how horrible that is you know a lot of times these kids, you know the gangs and the um, promiscuity all of that is their way of trying to find something to do with that energy that creative energy that creative energy is is needing to be guided and properly channeled and we need mentors we need programs and opportunities to provide that for our community now mr kane i think one time uh, you came to us and you talked about uh, some of the problems dealing with crime in in the uh, communities and so let's look in terms of resources that are available and why so many of our young people become involved mm -hmm. in crime and incarceration mm -hmm. and et cetera, and, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think that uh, uh, one time you, you gave us some similar kind of information. <clears throat> Let's talk about it from right. that perspective. Well, first let me say um, a quote that Dr. King used to always use. He says, 
He who gets behind in a race will forever remain behind unless he runs faster than the man in front. So we got started 244 years late in America. While our oppressors were you know, building banks and institutions, we were set free and giving nothing. You know, so we're still trying to deal with that. And so our kids today, in many respects, are um, confronted with no jobs, okay? Nothing to do, as, as Jamila mentioned. And so they're just kind of just sitting around looking for something to do, but there, there aren't any options. And so for me, we have to be about the business of trying to make America do what's right. Um, we have to make America see that it's better to go ahead and pay your debt to the, to the former slave ancestors in this country because if we're, gonna, if we're gonna make it in this country, we have to understand that you cannot do a wrong and act like it never happened and then say to us, you know, lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Well, many of us don't have boots, you know? So we have to try to grapple with this issue. And so it causes all the crime and the gang activity. And, and then, of course, you end up with a felony in this society. And so once you get a felony, I mean, your <clears throat> chance of getting a job is very, very slim. And so what does one do if you are a grown man with aspirations, but you don't have access to the capital in a capitalist society? So <laughs> again, we, we have to try to grapple with this thing and not turn our heads away from it because our kids are suffering as a result. Many of us are suffering as a result. Uh, 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 Mr. Terrell, looking at it from a political point of view, which is to say that if we're going to get more resources into a community, we have to have something that, 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 that's important in terms of what people who have the resources need. And we've got to vote. And so uh, but when, when you look at it from the perspective of Africans becoming involved in the political process in order to shake the money tree, you see, yeah. you can't shake the money tree unless you're involved in the process. And one of the most important processes, I, I, I would imagine that the two of you would agree, yeah. would be this whole prospect of voting. Yes. And I think that uh, one thing that, that happened when slavery came to an end, we talk about reparations and et cetera. Mm -hmm. One of the most important things that brought about uh, the uh, uh, gains that they were able to uh, achieve was primarily through their ability to participate in the suffrage. That's right. And so we've got, uh, and, right. and, and I think that, uh, and, that that we're coming up to a situation now dealing with voting, political participation, and et cetera, mm -hmm. even in Nashville here, which means that uh, a large number of Africans are not registered to vote. Mm -hmm. And see, if you're not registered to vote, and if you have been cut off from your suffrage by some mm -hmm. uh, activity, criminal activity mm -hmm. that you were involved in many, mm -hmm. many years ago, mm -hmm. then you are left without anything, you mm -hmm. see. And, and so as long as we stand out without being able to participate in the political process, there will be no change mm -hmm. in terms of what the two of you are talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There are no changes unless you can bring pressure That's onto right. the folks who are making rules and regulations at the uh, 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 state legislature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and the two of you have it within your power. Sure. But the thing about it is that you have to get out and, 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 and work with people and, and, and get involved in the political process, mm -hmm. and especially at, at a time like mm -hmm. now. This, mm -hmm. It's crucial mm -hmm. that we be, see the last election that we had uh, only 6%, 6 out of 100 wow. people voted in the mm -hmm. metropolitan election. Mm -hmm. Wow. You see? Mm -hmm. And that's not only black folks, that's, that's six, people. 6 out of 100 folks voted out of the people who are registered to vote. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is to come up with some kind of coalition. You talk about a coalition. Yes, yes. See, um, that's, that's, that's the coalition. As long as you stand around, and, and talk about reparations and let's recall how it was. The only thing you need to recall about uh, the, the old days about reparations and talk about that is the fact that when Africans came out of slavery, they had the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, and the 15th Amendment, Amendment, and they were able to use them, and we no longer know how to use the 13th Amendment. Mm. It's, it's just that simple. Mm. And so as long as you don't get Africans to come out and vote, you can't shake the money tree. Mm -hmm. You can't make them do what you want them to do in mm -hmm. Congress. Mississippi is going to improve that, you mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be proved in the upcoming election because, well, we face a time now when black folks are really faced with making a choice. 
Yes, you know, we are. And um, the only choice they can make is to what? To vote. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to push our politicians to focus on women and children. Vote. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Would you yeah. say that? Yes, they'll do that if they understand that they are supported by, by the vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, and, and, and if they're not supported by the vote, even on uh, local elections or even on the national level, it really doesn't matter because that's what, uh, that's what a large number of money people are paying for when they give money to these politicians, mm -hmm. they are paying for what? For votes. Yes, they are. They are paying for it in the Senate or on the state legislature, and what we have to do and what you have to do is to uh, understand it from that perspective. Certainly there's debt reparations, there's <coughs> relief, and et cetera, mm -hmm. but the only relief that you have is the vote. Well, if I could just kind of add to what you're saying. We had Please do, since this is your show. Oh, no, 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 okay. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> well, we had uh, Congressman John Conyers come down in April uh, for our conference on debt relief and reparations, and so he is one of the oldest sitting members of Congress today, but a few of our politicians showed up locally. Mm -hmm. well. So so we have, it's not just voting, it's also organizing ourselves. Organizing yourself to vote. Uh -huh. um, yes, and so there are many things that we have to do, but we have to begin doing it right away. Okay, you know. very good. And of course, let me, uh, we're coming to the end of this show for today, okay. and I want to thank the two of you for coming by and bringing that excellent information. And let me also encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good morning.